for those of you, of you who don't know, this is the weekend to the day, to the year, last year, where me and John sat down and really decided that we were going to, he was courting me at breakfast, <laughs> and, and this, this, and here we are a year later sharing the stage, right? So it's, it's just wonderful, and Argan, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity. So a little bit about myself. My name is Min Tran, for those of you guys who don't know me. I'm originally from Windsor, Ontario, Canada, a little town just across the river from Detroit, Michigan, and of course, most recently, I made the trek across the country into a new country to join John Wilson here in sunny, well, mostly sunny Southern California. It's been a little <laughs> bit. I brought the miserable Canadian weather with me, I guess. I've uh, been in the industry since 2006, and I spent the majority of that time behind a computer using a mouse and keyboard, primarily using 3Shape, uh, but I've used a wide variety of digital technology. And a little bit about Sunrise and Dental Tech Tips as well. I run Dental Tech Tips, which is a blog and an online uh, publication where we focus on the latest and greatest in dental technology. Is that me? Hello? OK. Don't move, okay. I'm good with technology, guys, I swear. <laughs> so anyways, dental tech tips. We focus on the latest and greatest in dental technology, not microphone technology. Uh, a little bit about myself and John. Between us, we have over 10,000 dentures fabricated. What's that? Agree that you're wrong. Look, let's not fight. I mean, my God, we have two Academy Awards between us. This is beneath us. <laughs> Did you win an Oscar? Well, not when you put it like that, but you have two Academy Awards, so technically there's two between us, okay? Can we just... So as I was saying, between us, we have 10,005 dentures between us. John has 10,000, I have five. <laughs> <laughs> so John, tell, the, tell them a little bit about, about yourself. Well, you know, I've been at this game a long time. I, I do run a, a, a small little bespoke laboratory in uh, Yakaipa, California. I've been around this game a long time and, and uh, was fortunate to uh, court this gentleman uh, on my left over here to come and join my team. It's been a wonderful little uh, adventure over the last six months, and we're ramping up to do some exciting new things. So today is the first time I get to share the stage with him, and I'm really fortunate to have that opportunity. Uh, as I stated, I've been doing this 38 years. I started classically as a denture technician, and uh, dentures will always have a soft spot in my heart. I think that they're... Uh, very seen negatively a lot of ways, and I'd like to dispel that myth. You know, we specialize in implant dentistry in my laboratory. We are uh, looking for clients that want to have titanium or a hole in some sort of way in their restoration. You know, we do a lot of dentures, but mostly over dentures that are supported by some sort of implant. You know, we utilize digital workflows exclusively in my laboratory. You know, we've taken our analog background and, and really morphed it to be able to be more efficient in the digital realm. And, you know, I, I am lucky enough to have two wonderful children, uh, both graduated college now and in the workforce. I have a wife that somehow st stands by me with all my jackassery. And, uh, <laughs> I am a dog dad, and I love to play golf, and, and uh, I'm happy to be here today. Fantastic. So for Sunrise Dental Lab, you want to speak a little bit about how you founded Sunrise, and then sure. a little bit more about your, your trajectory to here? The interesting thing is, is you know, we all start somewhere. You know, I was uh, left home early, and uh, you know, typical punk kid thought he knew everything, and somehow I wandered into a dental laboratory. They were hiring a... Uh, a driver position, and I needed to make some income. So I got my feet wet in there, and five years later, I had enough knowledge. Five years, I had enough knowledge to think I can start my own business. So I did, and uh, started a, a trajectory on a path where I took uh, a seven day a week, 13 hour a day, 10 year lifespan of making something that resembled a denture. <laughs> And we transitioned to a big laboratory, uh, grew it to 50 men, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that path as we go on. And of course, now we're Sunrise Dental Lab. So of course, this is some of the technology we, we have there. This is our little, John started in a garage. He stuffed me in a garage with all this stuff, actually. That's, <laughs> so you have an affinity for garages, but all this technology in that garage is fantastic. And of course, uh, I always like to plug social media, and this is actually one of the key, you know, things that led me to John. I've, I've followed him my whole career, but I help run with Savon here, the Three Shape Study Group. We have almost over 45,000 members now. Um, I also run the, help run the Asiga Dental Experts Group, just under 10,000. 
uh, Dental Technicians of Canada. John also runs the Iowa Clark Programmel User Group. That has 9,000, 7,000, 7, yeah. And I also, this is my favorite one, the Three Shape versus ExoCAD group. <laughs> but really, b between myself and John, we really collect Facebook groups like Thanos collects Infinity Stones. <laughs> so I, I always like to plug social media because it, it's such a wonderful way. If you enjoy coming here, if you enjoy socializing with your peers, if you enjoy learning, every day online really is like coming to one of these conventions. And it's just been such a great way to collaborate and make lifelong friends, really. So this is our agenda for today. So we're going to speak about effective communication. We're going to speak about how we tackle these things and communicate all these interdisciplinary cases and complex cases. Uh, we're going to speak about, you know, sort of pontificate about commoditization a little bit and how we make our formula work, uh, the ethics and taking a patient-centered approach. And then we're going to have a little fun. And uh, maybe some of you guys are only here for that $100 gift card that uh, I advertise online. But uh, we're going to have a little bit of a fun little trivia game. So my friend Mark Dixon, a dear friend of ours, did a fun little game show online. It was called Teledental Wits during uh, COVID. And I, I kind of had a little spit on this. We're going to play Geo Parody. So quick show of hands, who would be interested in volunteering today? Just to kind of see. Let's see. Oh, no, no. OK, what if I tell you guys we're going to try and sprinkle as many answers in there as possible throughout the course of this presentation? Who's, it who's, really is who's willing to, to volunteer? Yeah, one, there we two, go. One, two, three. Awesome. Okay, Savon, you're go. Okay, one, two, and three. There we go. Awesome. Awesome. If we were going to have like a deluge of people, I was going to have this QR code. People are going to enter their names, but okay, we got three. We're good. And we spent all this time it's gonna be this fun. together. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to take a little quick five-minute break, and we'll, we'll just set everybody up, and we'll get going close to the end. But of course, we're speaking about communication. You guys are here. Maybe you just read the description. You want to understand how to communicate effectively. And why is communication important? Maybe you just want to be a little bit of a better communicator because technicians are notoriously fantastic communicators, right? That's why we love living at the bench. <laughs> of course not. So maybe you're a little bit more introverted and you just want some tips and tricks and maybe you know want to adopt the gift of gab a little bit more. So effective communication and uh, how it affects patient outcomes, right? Ultimately, we're making medical devices. And these things are, are health devices that are going into people's bodies. We want to make sure that when we are communicating, we're being very effective, that we are making sure that we're ensuring what the dentist is requiring, what the patient wants is accurate to that. And we want to make sure that we're minimizing mistakes. So if we can communicate effectively, have channels of back and forth communication between the lab and the clinician or the clinic, then we're going to reduce mistakes and make sure that we're, we're you know, very effective in the, the way that we're executing everything. John, this is you. I love this part. You know, I've, I've been a technician for a long time and I've, I've ran a, a successful business somehow for all these years. And, and in the beginning, you were forced to take whoever wanted to send you work. And as I morphed along my career and, and found some sort of semblance of success, you could decide whether or not you wanted to work with somebody or not. We're very fortunate today. We have the, the sincere pleasure to be able to pick and choose the clients that are going to partner with us. And it's all based on a relationship. So how do you find the right clients? What are you trying to do? What, what are you looking for in a client? Are you looking for the guy that's going to write A2 uh, Zirconia crown on, on RX and not give you any other details? Or are you looking for a guy that really wants to communicate more effectively with you and have a relationship? I believe that everything in this life is based on how you put yourself out there. You know, my clients partner with me, not because my restorations are that much better than yours. They know that I am a true partner to them and our relationships jive together. We're, we're specifically matched. So it took a long time to get to this position where I had the luxury to be able to work with people that had like-minded thoughts. It's not easy, guys. And there was a time where, like I said, we had 50 techs. We had clients everywhere. And most of them were royal pain in the asses that didn't care. They certainly weren't looking for quality. It was all based on price, and we were working ridiculously to the point where it was not fun. It was impossible to have any real pleasure in your, your work environment. And I decided I didn't want to do it. I was going to change completely. And with that, those hard choices came in. It was a very scary time. But forging partnerships, guys, is about 
having the ability to own what you're doing. I think as we move forward, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So often, if you're just looking to get that case out of the laboratory and you're not really connecting on and looking past what you're just is in front of you, we lose sight of the fact that we're actually working for a patient. It's going in the mouth. You know, if you're looking at just making widgets, guys, you know, that's not very fulfilling. And yeah, you can make revenue with it and you can make a life, but isn't it better to really think about the connections that you're making and the real changes that you're doing in this world? You know, when I started, as I said, I made something that resembled a denture. It didn't function great, certainly didn't last long, but I took that information and I decided that I wanted to do something better. And with that, I had to expense myself. So it's no different when you have a client that's looking for something to connect with. So looking for those clients are very difficult to find, but you have to be, have ownership of your role in the equation. So John, you're pretty famous for, uh, I, I call them Dear John letters, and he, he, he quite famously likes to, if, if the doctor's not up to snuff, he'll fire them with a Dear Doctor letter. So John, let's... let's this uh, sounds uh, really horrible. Yeah, and the truth, <laughs> the, the truth is, guys, it's, it's not that I am an egomaniac, but I just want to enjoy life. I, I believe that I've amassed a, a set of wisdom that is going to be valuable. And I work with clients that connect with me on that. And often, when you get your first case from a client, you know you're going to work your ass off to make that case that much better to try to impress them. It goes both ways. If they send in their first case and you can't see a margin or the impression coping is loose in the impression or the scan is short, well, what are they telling you at that point? They're auditioning for you as well. It's a symbiotic relationship. You have to recognize that. So you know what? We give a little bit more. We try a little bit harder. We try to develop a relationship. Show them something different. Because invariably, unless they're first day out of school, they've used another laboratory somewhere and they left them for a reason, right? So if we really resonate on the fact that they're looking for something different, well, you have to be different. So how do you be different? You work with these guys, you try things, you give of yourself in a manner that is more than what is expected. And we'll talk a little bit about more of that in detail. Absolutely. And we're going to speak about saying no, not just to the client itself, but sometimes it's your responsibility. If you see something in the case itself that you know, isn't going to work, you, it's, it's really ethically your responsibility to say no. And how often? You'll get a case in your laboratory. You'll look at this and you'll chuckle and say, this is a piece of crap. <laughs> what do you do? Do you just make that case and be done with it and hope it never comes back? Or do you try to educate your client to say, hey, you know what, doctor? I, I see this might have been a challenging case. There were some struggles here. And I see that I could probably make this sort of restoration. But what if we backed up a step here and, and really looked at how we could make this thing spectacular? Those are hard words to come from a tech, and a lot of techs are really afraid to have that type of dialogue. I don't believe in that, guys. I believe there's people that want that, and there's people that don't want that. They don't want that? Well, hey, that's your business model. You don't want to have any connection with that? Hey, hallelujah, that's what you're going to do. But me, I want to do my best at all times. And if I can communicate that at the beginning, I can grow a relationship over a long period of time. Today, I have friends in dentistry. I don't just have clients. These guys are my friends. They resonate with the fact that they know I'm going to give more to them and look past them, and I'm going to critique them. You know? And don't be afraid to do that. It's important to be able to take your role and to be able to talk to your clients as a friend. It's really important as, as I see it. And forging true partnerships is the, the best way to segue into this, right? Yeah, the, the best clients are your, your best friends. So, so honest there. You know, as, as I jump ahead on these types of things, I, I like to get the points across that, you know, this didn't happen overnight. But if you don't try to do something different today, you're going to be that much farther away from your goal. You know, I, I made a radical change in my life by realizing that the trouble clients 
needed just to go away. And losing that revenue and trying this stuff and trying to figure out the guys that really care was very difficult. You know, taking an account base and, and literally giving them a, a ranking from one to 10, and then picking and choosing who you're gonna cut to allow you to grow with the guys that are rank a 10. Give more, give more. How do you gain the respect? You gain the respect by talking to them as their equal. Don't be afraid, guys. Talk to them as your equal. The more wisdom that you amass, you may be doing hundreds of a specific type of appliance that maybe they've done 10, okay? Give them the wisdom, share with them, be honest. Give of yourself. It's very important, it's time consuming, but those relationships will forge and you will be able to adapt and pivot for the guys that are just not gonna embrace that. Those are the people that are gonna be very difficult to sway. And those are the clients you don't want. The ones you want are gonna grasp and, 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 and embrace you and, and, and say, wow, I've never had a lab technician tell me this. They want this, especially the guys that jump from lab to lab. They jump to lab to lab because they can't find what they need. It's your job to figure that out. And it's certainly not that flipping crown. I can tell you that right now. It has more to do with your connection with them as a person. Final thing is, is my BS, my belief system. It's something that is, is super important. If, if, if you're an uncaring person and you're going to do the base minimum to take a, a scanner impression, and you're gonna dictate that to staff and you're never gonna look at it and you just hope the restoration is gonna come back and fit and you're not going to critique it, you're gonna grind the hell out of it and it will never come back to me. Well, some of you guys think those are the perfect clients, right? I guess it's how you, you look at it. At one time, that was something I had to deal with. Today, I'm fortunate enough not to have to go down that road and it makes my head hit that pillow at night feeling that I've done my best because I know I'm partnering with people that have the same belief system, so. So this is our patient-centric approach. So the team approach to dentistry, guys, everybody coins that and talks about it and, and really thinks about it. But if you really think about it, guys, you know, we're on either side of the patient here. We have two people that are, you know, vested. We want to make a change. We want to come together. We want to listen to one another. And it's all for what reason? It's all for the benefit of the patient, right? So in the past, it was always script would come in, we'd look it over and we'd fill it and be done. What benefits the patients more is the wisdom of the other team members. So if one team member says, hey doc, yeah, that's a great idea, but maybe if we pivoted and did this, make a suggestion. Strengthens the team and with that strength, becomes the, the garner and respect that you're going to take to raise your fees. Make a better life for yourself and your family because you are worth it, because you're giving more. That's what's value in communication. That belief system and the ethics to have the benefit for that patient is ultimately what we do every single day in my lab. And conveying that to technicians, conveying that to, to your staff, you have to be a unity, you have to have a family, you have to be able to understand that it's, yes, it's a business. Yes, it has to be run effectively, but ultimately we're changing lives, guys, especially the type of dentistry that I specialize in. It's not just patch them up dentistry. Those are the things that make lifelong changes and will give you longevity in this career. You know, I just didn't get lucky to get this much gray hair. <laughs> I worked hard at it. Lots of years in this trade and doing this and it all stems from your connection with your clients. So in terms of future-proofing yourself, there's a real paradigm shift in terms of the role of the dental technician. Of course, we take that team approach. We have great clients, but every technician can really take this. Right? We're gonna have a, a shift in the way that technicians are gonna interact just because of the advent of digital technology. We're gonna find that there's gonna be a lot more clinical technicians. I consider myself, John considers himself, a clinical technician in a commercial laboratory setting. And that really is, is for the fact that we're looking past the script, right? We're using our clinical knowledge. We're, we're using what we know in a comprehensive manner to really drive these types of treatments. You're also gonna find there's gonna be technicians in clinics. So the 
as dentistry as a whole grows and as it changes and there's all these shifts towards technology, technicians are not just gonna be guys at the bench in some dungeon or, or with Bunsen burners and wax all over the place. You're gonna have to really look at the clinical aspect of all this. We're not just filling a prescription, we're, we're actually driving treatments. But you're also gonna have the advent of technical dentists. Right now with DSOs, with commoditization, with commercialization of dentistry as a whole, there's a lot more dentists taking on technical roles. With 3D printing, you're gonna find there's gonna be a lot more in-office procedures. So what do you do? Can you make a living off of single unit crowns at $60? Probably not. But a lot of that is gonna be shifted away from the laboratory towards the dental clinic. And really, you have to differentiate yourself. I'm an RDT from Canada, and actually one of the things when you're uh, in our regulations is you cannot advertise that your product is superior to another person's product because it's not, it's fundamentally untrue. I have the same access to argon zirconia as everybody else. The same technology, unless I hold some really weird patent to some really unique technology, but that's, that doesn't make me necessarily superior. I cannot make a better crown than anybody else but how can I differentiate myself? And when you look at all these companies, the top performing companies, the most valuable companies in the world, they don't necessarily have the best product, but it's really more in the way that they interact with their clients, how they make the customer feel. So when I text my client and I go, hey, great job today, how does that make him feel, right? Rather than the, the just delivering a crown that you know, has better contacts, or we can all do that. With digital technology, it levels that playing field but how do you differentiate yourself? And really, that, that's, that's really one of the, the reasons why I, I, I really wanted to join John on this, this lifetime opportunity to, to work with somebody I respect, but he has an alignment in the same level of belief and a way to differentiate myself and not have to pound the pavement until you know, I become 38 years in the industry with gray hair and I'm growing out a mustache. <laughs> But, but, but really, it's, it's a way to, to move away from commercial ubiquity because it's like John says, we're just making widgets if we're doing this rather than driving health outcomes. And of course, his famous quote that I've quoted many times, single unit quadrant dentistry is dead. Right? So this is why we, we do the, the types of cases that we do. Still pays the bills, guys, but literally, if you're relying your, your business model on quadrant dentistry, uh, it's going to be short-lived. It's it's completely changing. You know, the industry is going to morph to the point where it's not going to be a viable thing for you to sell, especially if you're a small little lab. It's going to be very hard to compete on margins that are just so thin already in a lot of ways. I believe your best pass of success in this uh, uh, industry today is to specialize in something. Learn something more than what you're doing today and Embrace it and recognize that comprehensive treatment is not a scary thing. Yes, it takes time to learn. Yes, it's an it's important part of what we do every single day. But the rewards that you get out of it are so, so, so rich. I, I, I feel more wealthy with the feelings that I've done to be able to change lives. And, and that's a, 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 a telling statement because there was many times in my career as I was coming up that... You know, we were just, you know, participating in, in the patient that's in the crown of the month club. And uh, you would see that name come up over and over and over. And you'd look at the data and you'd maybe look at your, your, your work in the mouth and see that the doctor ground the living hell out of your restoration. And, and you start wondering, well, hey, did I put everything I could into that restoration at that time? Was it fulfilling? Well, probably not. And it got cemented anyways. So how about look to be a little bit different? You know, specialize in the things that are gonna be rewarding. And with that, you're gonna have a longevity because the computer can only do so much. The AI and all the stuff that is coming today, don't fear it, embrace it. It's gonna make you stronger. It's gonna give you the opportunity to do some amazing things, but you have to specialize. And that's where I think that that quote stands. So let's, let's dive into the weeds a little bit. And John, you can tell a little bit of a story about how we communicate and, and really how things have changed over the years. John, you've uh, famously done many California commutes at your previous lab. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's go into some. So the, the most amazing part of technology and, and what we've been able to see over the years and what we're doing today is so vastly different in communication. 
you know, very simply, how did we get clients in the past? It was either word of mouth, you have a client say, hey, you know, this guy is my lab boy and he's doing amazing work. Give him a try, you know, just give us a little shout out. And it was always condescending and it was always self-serving and it was always got to the point where, well, maybe I shouldn't share his name with anybody else because then my work's not gonna be so good. So that communication was kind of dated back in the day. But for us, if we wanted to grow, back in the day before we had uh, you know, social media or the internet, Everything was direct mail marketing. And direct mail marketing was a very powerful thing to do, but it was very costly. And small labs never used it effectively. They would say, okay, I need to get 10 new clients. And they would run ads for three months and think that that branding was gonna work and they were gonna bring people in. And it was, that was the way that you got your, your point across. What I did back in the day to grow my laboratory was I looked at what other ads came in. I would go to my client's office, I said, save every piece of literature that comes in. Put it in this box and we pick up once a week, I'll take it. And I would read it. And I would look at what products they were pushing and look. And then I looked at my core audience. I wondered who did I want to work with? What clients fit the demographic better? How was I going to be able to tailor my marketing specifically to those people? And back in the day, my metric was if you were out of school, and this is going to sound very chauvinist, but it was a male doctor. 10 to 15 years out of school in a small city that had less than two laboratories in their city. And I piggybacked and I hit every one of those things multiple times for a year. And I got half a percent out of all the things that we would do, but that growth was sustainable. It was something that was working and that communication for me back in the day was our only way to grow outside of our local area. And that's how I started to get mail order into my little lab, little tiny flipping lab. These people are boxing it up for some reason because I've communicated an ideal based upon piggybacking on somebody else's communication. It was cheap. It was kind of innovative for the time for a small lab like this and, and it worked. Today, we have so many more powerful tools to attract attention. And the communication between your existing clients versus a potential new client is very unique. Today, when we're talking with our clients, we, we like to use the asynchronous me method. How often have you picked up a telephone to call your client, front office says, oh no, he's in the middle of a procedure, I'll leave a message for him, and he'll call back. And you're in the middle of something. And you're in the middle of something. <laughs> and you play that tag game, and it doesn't flip and work. What we've been able to do with text and uh, you know, a, sending a simple little voice message is so powerful. I'm gonna talk more in depth about this because I really believe that your inflection, your tone, your, your voice connects with them as a person rather than just some guy across the country. You know, these people become my friends because we have a daily conversation. I talk to some of my clients more than my wife. <laughs> she probably is happy about that, but, uh, but literally guys, it's so easy talking to your phone, convey a message, send it to them, He's busy, he'll play it, he'll send one back. But the bigger benefit of it, it controls your time. The most important thing, how many times you've been in the middle of a case and you're working and you know you gotta talk to this doctor because you need this information but you don't have the time at this point but you take the call anyways and it should be a two minute call that turns into 20 flipping minutes. Well, you're developing the relationship but you're not controlling the outcome of the message that you need to do. So using these methods are a super powerful way to be able to control your time. And there's accountability to this and record keeping. Today, we're utilizing multimedia way more than we ever, ever have. We use video, we, we use pictures, obviously. Uh, and, and the phone, that powerful tool that is in every one of our pockets oh, are yes. an amazing I thing. Like your plan. We'll go back, but yeah, the phone is, is a very powerful tool. Yeah, so this, this thing, you know, men can run, run through some of these things, but the truth is you have so many ways to talk to your client effectively and to be able to catch their attention. And you are making a personal comment. If you're just texting, well, it's fine, but you don't, if it's a newer client, he doesn't know your voice, he doesn't know if you're frustrated, he doesn't know if you're happy, he doesn't know where you're at. And that's where the phone call or the in-person or the shake your hand type of mentality has changed. So let's get back to that, but do it in a manner that you can control. 
I think that, that the voice recording to me has been a game changer for us. You know, there's been clients all over the country I've never met, but I feel like I know them. We may FaceTime, we may talk a little bit about this. These guys are connected to me. They're buying me. They're not buying my restoration. They're buying the, the truth when I pick up the, the phone at 5 a.m. because they know I'm up and they're on the East Coast. That connection is powerful. And I believe that this is your most powerful tool in your life, it really is. And really voice recordings rather than text. I know, again, dental technicians, not, we're more introverted, right? But let's say you're sending a text message. Well, maybe not no, you, no. maybe not you. I'm actually an introverted person, believe it or not, right? And um, if you'd like to send a text message to your client, maybe they just had a procedure and they're running behind, their day is terrible, the patient just you know, reamed in them for something, and they're in a bad mood. They pick up the phone, they read the text, they don't hear your inflection, they don't hear what you're trying to convey to them. They're associating that negative feeling of reading that text with you. Whereas if you pick up the phone, you go, hello, Dr. John Wilson here, and uh, today we're gonna be doing a full arch double, it's a completely different thing. It changes their perception in that moment and they don't associate that same negativity. So watching and hearing John use this very powerful tool, it, it changes the, the dynamic of your relationship with the doctor. It's not just through, te through reading and associating certain feelings. It's, it's you as a person and connecting in that way. We're gonna back up a little bit because you got a little bit ahead of yourself, but- I always do. Yeah. Yes. This is a great like plan. There's no audio to cut it, it out. Sucks. But it's let basically, plan. I like your plan. Wait. It's a great plan, but let me do the plan because then it might not suck. But <laughs> really, modern communication allows us to control the path, control the duration, like John was saying. And you don't run, run behind the day. It's on your terms. But it also allows you to compose your competence. And I think that's more the big thing, right? Maybe you're not, you're not a great orator. Maybe you don't have the gift of gab. But maybe you can sit down and write a really, really good email. Or maybe you're really good at responding to comments on Facebook like me. <laughs> and you just respond really, really long, detailed comments. And really, we all have different competencies. We do full arch implant. Maybe you love having gray hairs and doing single central veneers, and that's your business model. That's your competency. But at the same time, how do you convey that competency? Many people will go onto Instagram and post beautiful pictures, right? And that's what the doctor is gonna see, and that's how you convey what you're able to do. So really, modern communication allows us so many different ways rather than sending snail mail or just on the phone or only through fax. You're able to communicate in so many different ways. But again, of course, accountability, tracking. We're gonna cover that a little bit more in, in some of the other slides later, but it really does aid in all of these, these different things. So we've covered some of these already. Email, I think, is still a very powerful tool. Uh, you get inundated all day long with notifications, text messages, this and that. But if you're trying to drive something very serious or you want to you know, CC some team members, or you want to be able to go back and track and search things and say, you know what, on October 3rd, the doctor said, yeah, the impression's fine. Go ahead and proceed. You can go back there and, and, and do that because that it aids in accountability and who owned that decision at that point in time. Whereas, okay, well, yeah, you told me on the phone that we're gonna do this. It's kind of he said, she said, right? So that there's so many ways that, that communicating with, with this tool in our pocket, it's the most powerful thing you can do. And of course we have dental specific apps, photography. I love photography. Look at this beautiful photo I took of John's work here. It conveys, like I said, a certain message of, of the type of clientele and, and what they should expect from us, right? So that, so many ways for us to communicate. And let's touch a little bit on video. We're gonna go into depth a little bit more, but uh, Again, when, when we're talking about these big multidisciplinary cases, very difficult cases, lots of different, uh, you need to be on the same page with your client you know, throughout the treatment. But in the beginning, when you start on these things, you may get a script from him. He may even send you a video. When you re re review the data and you put the correlation together and then you send a video back. And we'll do screen grabs on, on uh, the computers for all our designs when we're talking about big quality cases and we're looking for certain things that we're trying to convey and make sure that we're exactly on the same page before we get too far. The video is a super powerful tool. We use a system called Loom and it's a 
subscription-based service, but essentially it's like a YouTube channel for your communication with your clients. And essentially what it is, it allows them to review that data at their leisure and make a comment on it. And it stays into the, the, the case's permanent record and it allows you for accountability. The accountability is, is a, a two-way street. Just don't think that you have to follow their directions. That's, that's obvious. But when you make a suggestion and you want to really drive treatment a certain way, video is a super powerful way to do that and you have a way to refer back to it multiple times throughout the treatment and it's super powerful. So yes, Loom is really good because you can share these things, you can comment with certain timestamps. The doctor has a specific private link they can go through it. It's a really powerful tool, but if you don't wanna go with that subscription route, you can always use free options, right? So Logitech Capture, it's from Logitech, it's free, you install it on your computer, captures everything in HD and you can show the doctor and just send it to them. Or if you use uh, NVIDIA, they have their GeForce Capture software as well. There's many different options, right? But uh, this video, being able to convey this to the doctor is so, so powerful in so many ways. One thing I will say about Loom or any other service that has encrypted links that you're sending, you're, you're protecting the privacy of the data. But more importantly, the, the accountability of having the, the information there, it's flipping 10 bucks a month to subscribe to this thing. You know, that's a couple cups of coffee, guys. And the protection of it on a third party level is it's it's super important i believe that you know the data should be protected and you know there's laws for it there's really laws to be able to do this to to protect these patients this is a really clean way to keep yourself clean and to be able to share the data in a in an appropriate safe manner absolutely so you want to speak a little bit about how we use dropbox yeah well? so so dropbox to us is is probably um, you know, an expensive way to share files. But uh, for us, you know, email is, is hit and miss. There's always gonna be things that bounce and, and relaying back is cumbersome to look back through your old emails and, and to try to get all the data associated with that. So every client that we do these big cases with, we'll set up a Dropbox account that has a folder specific just for their stuff. And inside that folder, every folder will be the patient's name. And inside that folder will have every different record that comes through. So that's in, it's perpetually there for you at any point where you think, oh man, I remember seeing that transition line being a little bit different in the pre-op photo. Let's go back to that and have it right there. And it's an offsite format so that you always have that data to be able to refer back to as you move forward, maybe you're gonna do one arch and then three years later, you're gonna do another arch and you can go back and have all this stuff. It also allows you to save your files offsite again. So multiple places, there's nothing worse than to lose data and storing it is cheap. Organizing it and chronicling it is a little bit difficult and every file has a date stamped on it guys. So you're gonna know when this was done. All this stuff is there, you can, you can recognize is this a pre-op photo? Is this the prototype photo? Is this the definitive? You have all this information, it's very easy, and Dropbox has been a super powerful tool to be able to utilize that. It's probably spend way too much money on it, but I'm telling you, it works great for us, and, and I would recommend that you look into that service. Yeah, and uh, it's, again, with that piggybacking off that date and timestamp. So who here works for like a little bit of a larger lab? Maybe you're like a manager that interacts with clients, maybe? Okay, so let's say you spend a lot of time on the phone then, right? And you have technicians that are working on specific cases. So let's say Dr. Smith calls in and he's looking for this uh, six unit case. They bring you the case in 30 seconds. You have to get familiar with everything on that script and everything that's in that case plan. Right, so with Dropbox, with all these different things, we have notes, we take notes, what John did, what I did, what the doctor wanted us to do at certain specific times. I can look at our case format. This is the diagnostic folder, this is the prototype. Okay, we're gonna take it to finish as a result of that. I know where we are in this treatment process. So it makes things a lot quicker, so you're not scrambling to figure out, okay, well, which of these seven impressions is the one we're working on, all right? So it, it's super powerful to be able to organize your, your thought process. I, I'll say one thing. Back in the day, you know, I, I, I was a bit of a weirdo. I could remember every patient that I ever worked on. And I could re recall the, the little nuances. We could have 300 pans in the lab rolling at a time. And I would personally know every flipping case. I had a gift with that. 
today as I've aged, I certainly can't do that anymore. And having the records on this thing is super important. But more than that, guys, some of the treatments that we do are taking you know, a year time. And things have changed in a year. And having good records, making good notes, you finish your prototype, goes to the mill, you QC it, you take flipping 30 seconds, type up exactly what you did, put it into the case file, you have that as a permanent record. It's hard to get started doing that. It takes time. Nobody wants to put that extra effort in, but it's invaluable. So often on these big cases, we'll do a prototype. We know we had a little problem. Uh, doctors adjusted the bite. He's not put it there. There's no record of it. Comes back. We're correlating data. We're looking at it. We might miss something. But if you go back and read that, no, oh yeah, I remember I did that. Or, oh yeah, I made a second prototype for that case. Oh, where's the files for that? Having good records and 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 maintenance of these records and chronicling them properly is going to make you that much more efficient because this data is gonna be reused not just for this case right now, but maybe five years from now, you might have to remake something and review back to that stuff. Retain the data in a, a manner that is going to be repetitive for you to fix any potential problems down the line. So this is, uh, actually I saw this this morning, so I thought it was really relevant. Um, a little bit more diving into the tactics of, of how we tackle communication. And this was uh, from a friend of ours who posted this up online. And the short and simple of it is, is he has a really great client, excellent dentist, great margins, great impressions, but they're using traditional impression material. But the doctor recently purchased uh, Trios, I believe it is. Yeah. And he's experiencing fit issues. And he's done some troubleshooting. He knows what he's talking about. He goes, you know, I don't trust the printed models because there are little distortions and inaccuracies. I'm trusting the design, but when it comes off, the doctor still says the margin is a little bit short. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on here and how we communicate this to a client. Because I think a lot of us experience this with, with clients that are transitioning. He has a great relationship with this client. He doesn't want the technology to sour that relationship. So John, let's, uh, you can dive into the, you actually responded to this. So, yeah, yeah, so th this, this guy, he's an excellent technician, excellent analog technician is he's making his path to digital. And uh, you, know, you can ask poignant questions. Poignant questions are, are generally based upon your wisdom that you've amassed from you failing. You know, we've all failed, right? We've all seen the trouble that is associated with this type of stuff. I've had the most amazing analog clients that transitioned to, to digital and there is a scary point in the relationship because they're questioning everything that they've done as they amass the wisdom to be successful. This particular case, how do you com communicate with it? Essentially what's happening is a doctor is, is cutting a beautiful prep, maybe a little heavier uh, uh, shoulder margin than he should, and, and it's got a very sharp outside edge. The crown is getting produced and it fits perfectly, but the outside edge, the, the margin line, is gonna be shy of the outside margin of the tooth. Well, how do you convey what's going on with that in digital without destroying a relationship that you've had success with? It's about being honest with them and say, hey, technology's badass. It can do a lot of cool stuff. But once in a while, you have to alter your clinical side to be able to have an ideal restoration. This guy, if he's looking at it under 8X with loops, you're gonna see some type of issues. It's just gonna happen. So communicating back, he's reaching out on social media and like all the nerds that love to talk teeth after working a long day, me, we try to help this guy, but it's that communication. He's, he's throwing his hands up at this point and we don't want to lose a client. So we talk to them just like I'm talking to you now. It's a conversation, guys. You have to be able to own the potential problems and come up with solutions. And on something like this, and uh not this specific situation, but there's many situations where you, there's a transition period, right? And you really need to hold their hand. You need to, again, forge and strengthen that relationship. Tell them, expect to take a traditional impression, expect to take a digital impression. We're gonna do both, right? And you're gonna troubleshoot everything along the way. So you wanna make sure that you're a part of the equation, you're owning it, and that you're making sure that you're doing everything as best as you can. Because 
adopting the digital is, is really kind of a paradigm shift for, for clinicians, really, because they go to school, they go through all this training. And it's a completely different experience. If you put yourself in the shoes of your client, they work in 15 minute blocks throughout the day. We don't experience that as technicians, but they also, what they're doing is they will put an impression in the mouth. They will go do a clin check. They'll go to a different operatory. It's a completely different experience. It's a static object that's going into a mouth. They're going to wait for it to set for a certain amount of time. Then they're going to come back and take it out and inspect it. Whereas when they're working with the scanner now, it's a dynamic experience. They're sitting there, they're scanning the patient. They have to use a completely different set that they've never trained with. You have to have different hand-eye coordination. You have to be positioned different. You have to see the screen and you have to move in ways that you're not formally trained to do. So they're going through some very weird and scary changes too. So it's your job to, to really kind of hold their hand and be as competent as you can and convey that competence to make them confident in what they're doing. And you have to really think, okay, you've had success with this client. He, he loves you. You've been making amazing restorations. Now he wants to transition to, to digital. Well, do you want him to transition to digital? Well, of course. Transition to digital is going to be more efficient on your side as well as his. So it's in your best interest to be able to go the extra mile to help him get to that point. <coughs> okay, so let's get into a little bit more of the tactics, right? We've, we've pontificated, I think, enough in terms of, of, I think you guys understand where our belief systems are, our, our BS, essentially. Our BS. But how do, we, how do we gather the data? How do we evaluate? What do we do when we get this case? How do we communicate effectively? How do we tackle this? in an interdisciplinary manner using our knowledge, right? And John, uh, you can speak a little bit about your background in so dentures. I, I told you a little bit about, about it, starting with, with uh, doing um, uh, really poor dentures. You know, everybody that starts in, in dentistry, um, you start at the bottom with hopes that you're gonna get to the top. You know, you have a path, you have, have an idea of doing it, but along the way you develop very specific sets of wisdom that will aid you on all your additional cases as you move forward. Today, my analog background is the real reason why I'm successful in digital. Knowing how to set a tooth in a negative space has, has really taken all of my work to the next level. Actually, this is one of my five dentures. Kind of a little bit of irony there. But really, yeah, the, in terms of using your foundational knowledge of, of analog principles and transitioning that to <laughs> digital, that's much, much more valuable in terms of, of how we tackle these cases, right? John taught me something really weird because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Crown and Bridge technician and I don't know very much about dentures. But he said, listen, look at these two scans that came in and look at where the retromolar pads are in relation to the hamular notches and they were askew. And he goes, from looking at so many casts over the years, you understand to look at these anatomical markers in a specific way, and that's gonna get us much closer. We're gonna show you some examples of that as well, but John, go ahead and some more <coughs> denture principles and that, the foundational knowledge that we really. So the foundation of not knowledge is paramount for you to move forward and, and, and embrace new technology, right? You know, if, if you're going to use a specific set of points of reference, you know, visual, you know, and this is why uh, training new technicians is so difficult. You know, you take for granted all the things that you've seen. If you've sat at the bench and, and set a thousand dentures, well, you're going to have a pretty good correlation of what you're used to. If you've moved this tooth to this position, this incisor is inclined in this relation, how is it going to affect the function of that case? Well, today with our design libraries, you start designing a denture. They come in, you know, one by 28, you know, aligned and, and slapped in. Well, how are you really learning anything at that point? You're making something that resembles a denture, right? It's not gonna function. It's gonna clack together. You might have, get some luck to it. But if you have a background of understanding, if you do this, then this will happen. It transcends just not just this type of restorations, all restorations at that point. So having a background and understanding the principles is way more important than being that fancy designer that can click <laughs> and, and get things perfect. All right, so here's a case perfect for that actually. Um, so we get all this data in, what are we gonna do with it? So this is one of John's cases that he's gonna show you his thought process when we get these records in. So let me press play here. So the great thing about digital dentistry is we have an amazing amount of data sets. This, 
case comes to me, it's going to be an upper and lower all in X. And the data that came in is essentially a denture that's been relined. And it's been manipulated because it was a poor denture to get us a very nice plane of occlusion. But if you look at our reference points here on the digital, I have to find a way to correlate this information. I need to make sure that this byte is correct. My workflow in my laboratory on these big cases is to do a pre-surgical wax up that is then going to be transitioned with a specific set of coordinates that are going to come in on surgery day. So when we get a facial scan like this, it's a super powerful way to you know, obviously see where we're going to be able to place plane of occlusion, all this stuff. But when we look at this, you can see the 2D cross section. I don't know if it's close. Yep, that's good. Okay, so you can see, look how thick that palette is. Doc has put a, just a crap ton of reline material to level out that denture to support it. Well, that was great, that was smart. But with that, our contact points on those incisors are crap. We don't really know if that's the right centric relation. So we're going to validate it. And how are we going to validate it? Let's see if I can just fast forward. So it's a long, long video. And this is a video that I sent to my client. To show them exactly what we want to do and why so we want to do This is what I do. The extra step of the way, guys. Okay. So I make just a simple scan appliance. And this scan appliance is going to be used on surgery day. He's going to come in there. We're going to just make something that just occludes with that crappy denture in that relation. But here's the thing, the records that they took on that day, the day that they took this record, well, that reline's going to be in there, but well, what's going to happen to that reline in you know, the next six weeks before they come back for the surgery? So what do I do? I just print a denture. Print a simple denture that's going to occlude against this other appliance. And those little fiducial, scan markers up front markers. there are going to help me align it back to the intaglo. So it's a little sneaky way to, to just validate your data. He didn't ask for this. Not one client ever knows about that. That's my interpretation of the data, correlating the information and making a path to the finish line that is going to have a much higher room for success. So we make a, a, a nice wax up. Anybody can make some pretty teeth. That's the easy part. The hard part is taking your wisdom to know the pitfalls and try to put a system in place that is going to eliminate those challenges. So the cool thing about a case like this is I've done all my legwork before, you know, the surgical handpiece has been picked up at all. We have all of this data, but it still needed to be correlated. It still had to have the wisdom that you've amassed doing what you're doing. And you have to have the power and the wherewithal to communicate that to your client and this video is a powerful thing. When my client saw that, he was, wow. Am I the smartest guy on the planet? Hell no, I'm a stupid guy, but I come up with some great things once in a while. But this little thing is just how we're taking that mass of data, aligning things, putting it together, looking at it past just the cursory thing of, oh yeah, this are two arches and a face. And really realizing how we can make it better. So that's really what this video is all about. As we transition here, you can see the wax ups come in, implant Amazing. coordinates come in, we connect the dots. Next day, he has prototypes that we've gone ahead and milled out, colorized them, assemble the piece of the pie, screw on some analogs, and make some plaster casts of this for our cementation models when it comes forward to our, our zirconia prosthetics that we're going to make. So it allows you to maintain amazing records with a very simple data set. It looks like a lot of work here, guys, but I'm telling you it's very simple records coming in, but it has to be good data. And how do you know if it's good data or not without checking it? Well, this is how one way that we wanted to show you. No, I paused it for a minute. So if you look here <laughs> as well, you can see it looks really close, right? But there's little subtle nuances to this. If you look at the areas in yellow, that's the prototype that was delivered to the office. And if you look really closely, you can see that there's more yellow material, both on the maxillary and the mandibular arch. So what is that telling us? That's telling us that the records we got from the doctor were not accurate. The bite was collapsed this way. So we had to re-correlate everything in order to make it actually fit. It's really subtle, kind of hard to tell if you don't know what you're looking for, but we had to make sure that the records we were working with initially 
It was close, it was very close. And yeah, you could add acrylic, you can add whatever you want to add there. But why not have it right, right off in the mill? Yeah, and so often on these bigger cases, especially when we're working from, from a pre-op record, there's gonna be invariably uh, differences. We wanna maintain two things, plane of occlusion and centric relation. If you hit those two things, everything else is cake, simple. But those are the two hardest things to do. So the advent of facial scans, if you're not utilizing that in your laboratory, uh, I, I behoove you to look into it. It's still in its infancy. A lot of them are really crap and not really of value. Um, this is the InstaRISA protocol, uh, and we get good and bad scans with every system out there. It's more user dependent. It's not super friendly yet, but the technology allows for some powerful data to aid you in your restorations. We love it. Uh, I, I recommend you, you look into it and suggest it to your clients if they're not utilizing it today. Okay, so the STL file is really the uh the de facto file standard. So why do we wanna talk about STLs a little bit? We wanna talk about retaining data a little bit. We wanna talk about data retention. We wanna talk about data copyright because we're, we're moving into this new realm of, of dental technology and digital technology, especially when you're collaborating with clients, you know, long distance clients with technical dentists. When, if you're doing just a design service and, and again, that case ownership, we really wanna iterate case ownership. So. My brother is a, my brother-in-law is a photographer in uh, West Hollywood, and he. Uh, more power to you, that's your business model and great. But the first time your client asks you for the STL that you've designed, you've given away the power that you are retaining this information. You can help them out, you can do things like this, but how awesome is it to be able to have this data two years from now when something goes wrong? You are in demand at that point. They need you. It secures that relationship that much stronger. Why would you give it up? I, I just believe that the power of your relationships on this type of information is to retain this. This is your more or less intellectual property at that point. Don't give it up. It's important. And it's, it's beneficial too, because we have that one case that we've milled the prototype Three times now? Yeah, this is a good yeah, it's, story. It's, uh, so the patient, for whatever financial reason, cannot proceed to the final, right? If you, and every time, then a couple of years, the doctor says, well, can you please just mill us a new prototype? We just need to extend the life of, of wearing that prototype. We have that data. Yeah. If you provide them with that file and they get a printer or something like that, they don't need you anymore, right? So you want, you want to retain that data for that reason. Yeah, and, and being able to review back on that data, that's, that's the more powerful point. It might sound like I'm being a little stingy and holding this stuff and holding it to ransom, but it's not that, guys. I utilize this information to aid me in future cases. It's really a really powerful thing. And ultimately, there's going to be cases that if you don't provide a service and charge appropriately, you know, think about it, if you just were doing prototypes that's all you did. You know, you designed it, did the prototype with hopes that it was going to come back for the definitive restoration. Well, you're out of money. I mean, you're not going to be able to do it. You can't make enough just doing that aspect, in my opinion, and do it to the level that we are doing it today. It's very, very difficult. You know, there was a part of my, my career when I started taking on this case, the day the first RX came in, I'd charge for the entire case. 
completely up front. We prayed that that patient would die sometimes. That, uh, we'd, we'd collect that money. Sounds horrible, but there are certain cases that just were difficult, just didn't happen. I, I've, I've since changed that because I've, I'm working with a different set of clients today, and you know, there's a, a trust associated with it. But the fun part for me is to look on the computer and see how many arches I have out there in prototypes today and look at which ones went missing in action and start to put a correlation together on what, well, am I ever going to finish that case? So then it reaffirms that having this information is super powerful because one day they're gonna get it done, right? So again, guys, retain your information, you know, hold it dear to your heart, don't give it away. Uh, and with this, you can command a much higher fee structure as well because you are making your rules. Remember, you're in business for a reason, guys. You know, if I want to be a philanthropist, ha hallelujah. But I'm in business to make money with the ethics of doing my best. And how do I do that, guys? I do that by communicating effectively, retaining the data, and being true partners to my clients. And Pam brought up a really good point in her previous presentation there. Retaining this data, data is, is valuable, right? Because if you're at, at John's stage in his career where he's looking at transitioning, right? You're looking at selling your lab. The data that you hold on those patients is extremely valuable for the valuation of your business itself. Because a doctor can just take whatever and just go somewhere else. But if you have that patient's records and that patient's data over a course of five, 10 years, Selling that to somebody who would take that on and look through those records and be able to continue that treatment and have that continuity, that gives you uh, that person looking to buy your business so much value as well, right? So business valuation, data retention, really data has a lot of value. We don't think of it because you know, it's not a piece of equipment. It's not sundries, it's not fixed assets or chattels inside of your, your business, but data has, has tremendous value. Look at all the companies. Again, I'm, I'm really big on you know, looking at all these large companies. The biggest companies in the world, the most successful ones, they are data-driven companies. They possess so much data. It's so not, we really need to take this, this mindset when working with our own data. It's not a depreciating asset. It's, a, it's, it's an appreciating asset. It's worth more down the line. If you're going to do a prototype, I guarantee you the three prototypes for the specific case in the years, every one costs more. Why did it cost more? Well, my price is going up. I have no problem charging more, even though I'm rerunning the file. That's business, guys. So again, how great is it to have to do that? I don't think I'm gouging anybody. You know, the times change. Things are expensive. So it's an appreciating asset rather than a depreciating one. Okay, so our process, when we get some of this data, when we get some of these files in, right? So step one, step two, step three. First, you strategize. The doctor picks up the phone and he goes, I just got um, off uh, with the patient and uh, the patient wants to do a full mouth rehab. What do I need? You can tell them, okay, well, we need records, a, B, C, photos, face scans, whatever you may need. Just have a little powwow, sit down and just tell them, this is what we're gonna need for the next appointment. So once they go to that next appointment, they're gonna take all those records, they're gonna provide you with everything. And this is really the, like, the powerful part. I, I speak about design and diagnostics ad nauseum because I'm, I, it's been such a powerful thing for me in my career to be able to really drive these, these types of cases because you get to do you get to play with the case. You get to go in there, you get to open the video, you get to see and correlate data and say, you know what, based off of my design, based off of these root forms, based off of what I think and where these things should be, this is what I think we can do with this case. And you give them a prosthetic driven, a prosthetic minded outcome, and you give them a good, better, best. Sometimes doctors will ask for three different options. So you're gonna say, you know what, this is the budget option, this is the middle of the road option, and this is the halo option that they're gonna pay a premium for. And you're gonna present all three of those to the patient. Could you imagine if you were doing this traditionally, having to wax things up three times and sitting there and doing three full arches? Absolutely not. But with digital, you can do little tiny things. And then of course, we use all of our communication methods to really present this to the client. You don't need to bring the case there. You can send them a video. You can send them a capture. You can send them the 
send them the STL files. <laughs> we were just saying that. But sometimes you send them in a 3D viewer. You send them the STL files and they can manipulate and see in 3D. They can present to the patient. This is what your situation looks like blown up on their giant screen inside the, the operatory. And they get to see what we're talking about. And you show them the good, better, best. And we also, very often the doctor will ask us to present directly to the patient. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but sometimes we'll make two videos, one with a more technical lingo, where we're, you know, we're gonna open the video, we're gonna try and correlate these things and use technical language so the doctor understands, but the patient isn't gonna connect with that video. So the doctor will actually ask us to make a second video for the patient saying, Mrs. Smith, your smile looks like this. You wanted to look like Julia Roberts. We cannot do that because <laughs> you don't look like her. So uh, use simple language, right? So presenting two videos, doing all, <clears throat> it, it creates so much um, flexibility in the way that you present and collaborate. So this kid, do we have audio on this? Let's see. All right, yep. John. Um, okay, unplug. get some alignments done on. So I have a minute, so I'll show you what I've done here. Uh, so this is the scans here. So we got a whole bunch of scans from the doctor first off. You had Duchenne smile, face with tractors, upper and lower intaglio and occlusals of these things, of the, the dentures, and then natural smile and then repose with the lips at rest. So what I did first was I opened up a dummy order, brought in the occlusal surfaces of the um, the dentures, and then what I did was I brought in the intaglio surfaces of the dentures and aligned them. So I aligned the intaglio side to the uh, the occlusal side of the maxilla, and then I did the same thing on the mandible, occlusal side, and intaglio of the mandible. So then what I did was I saved these files inside this folder as manned and max 360 denture unrefined, unre unaligned, just because they are still both open shell. We're going to bring them in a mesh mixer, do a little bit of bridging and closing so we get um, some closed objects. Um, I think we're going to have to print these actually in hand articulate just to see if we can get something close, and I'll show you why. So what we did next is I brought in the face scan. So I started with the Duchenne smile just because we had the most teeth exposure on that one. Brought that one in and I started to align the faces. So the first one was the face with retractors and I aligned that teeth to teeth, uh, maxilla to maxilla. And we can see here, we got a pretty good alignment between those two. You can see here pretty much all blue. So we got a pretty good alignment, but you'll notice in the mandible with those retractors in, I think what happened was the patient's lower actually slid to the side. So you can see here that there's a midline mismatch and um, they, they're coincident in all the other scans. So I'm going to say that this one here should not be used for relating the mandible. So I'm gonna discard the face with the retractors. Next, I brought in the natural smile. And again, we did an alignment between the maxilla of both. And we got a pretty good alignment there. Again, I'll show you here how that alignment turned out. Not a lot of teeth showing, but we got quite a bit of blue. So I'm pretty happy with that alignment. And I'll show you something else a little bit later why I think those alignments are all pretty good. One thing I will note here is if we look at it from the profile, I believe um, based on my alignments that his Duchenne smile, the patient actually goes, went into protrusive and that his natural smile is the one that's in his centric relation or the most protruded position here. So what we're gonna do, I think is we're gonna use that natural smile as our alignment and reference for our maxilla and mandible alignments. So the last one, what I did was I brought in the repose. And the nice thing is the patient has quite a bit of prominent forehead ridges and also the earlobes were present in both scans. So what I did was I actually aligned based off of the forehead ridges and the earlobes between the repose and the Duchenne. And you can see here, we got a pretty good alignment between both. I think the positioning is, is actually really, really good. So I'm pretty happy with that. And again, if you look at these other scans comparatively with those, that, those forehead ridges, they look like we have pretty good alignment. And again, face with retractors. 
very good alignment with the full face. So what I did was I actually brought in the maxilla here and I aligned it to these teeth because we had a lot of teeth showing here. And again, we can check the alignment between the two. Pretty good. And then again, I brought the mandibular in and rather than aligning to this one, I brought it and aligned it to this natural smile just because I think that is the most retruded centric position. And when I tried to do an alignment to the Duchesne, you actually noticed quite a bit more opening in the posterior relation between both maxilla and mandible, where this one were a little bit closer in terms of the relationship between the two. It still looks open to me. Um, so I think what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to print these off, hand articulate them and use that kind of as our vertical alignment. Um, I don't think the, what we have aligned here to the faces is sufficient to get a, a good vertical so anyways, this is our alignments that I've gotten to. At least it gives us a starting point to see where we can go with this. Take a look at the files. Uh, I'll save these as well and, and just let me know how you want to proceed. So pretty powerful tool, Great. guys. Thanks. The, the most amazing part of this is that's a lot of flipping data, right? But the more powerful thing is a lot of flipping poor data. <laughs> It's horrible. It's, it's, it, we can go and do gymnastics and show you amazing things and how you can manipulate. All we're doing at this particular point is proving the fact that this data sucks. You know, the doctor just didn't understand how to correlate the information properly for us. And no matter how much gymnastics I do, I'm gonna have to compromise. So this video that he takes the time to make presents to me and now I got to make that flip and call or send him this darn video and that's what we did just to prove that you know what well we're going to make some scan appliances we're going to send them to you we're going to check it and sure enough the data was crap and the scan appliances were off and we were back at square one the, the guy got a lower arch uh, finished we just sent a denture with it and the bite was a flipping mile off and this was the client's first case with us and the last case with us. <laughs> you said the deer drop letter. <laughs> except, except I got to do the upper on, on Monday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, we, we didn't leave him hanging. And, and he's, he's a great guy. Like he, he's really new to this, but he's using some technology that's not perfect. And there's some, some stuff that's there, but that's aside the point that the real meaning to this video and our, our spending the time to try to outline it is no matter how great you are at your job, you have to start with ingredients that are going to allow you to make a masterpiece. And if it's not right, you have to be able to be strong enough to say, hey, doc, this is not going to work. So all that pontification to say, hey, you know what? Sometimes a lot of data is not great data and you have to be able to decipher it. So. Oh, so what we actually did was we printed those two, recorrelated them in occlusion scanned those dentures in with a desktop scanner, brought them in, we flipped out the intaglios, and that was our centric relation. That was our starting point. And then from there, we made our diagnostics, but it was still way off. The problem was, and the, whenever you're using a, a removable appliance to align, uh, you have tissue compression, uh, you have an ill-fitting denture, you have a, you know, a, an intaglio that was not managed properly in the scan. You, you saw he scanned the inside and he scanned the outside. And then we have to align those together. The best thing would be to take a reline impression inside of both those dentures, scan it 360 outside the mouth, put them both back in the mouth, capture the bite relation, send it to me, and then I can align and do everything. So that was his mistake. Plus he's using an Itero scanner. The older one is not great and it's not really suitable for this type of stuff and he's trying to do more than he should in this particular thing. Great guy, I love him, but we're not gonna be great partners because he doesn't align with the same fundamentals. You know, He wants to do this stuff, everybody wants to do this stuff, but at this point in my career, I'm going to partner with guys that are gonna give everything. He learned from this and I should give him one more chance, but I was so frustrated that uh, <laughs> I'm done, so. So yeah, we, we showed a little bit, but really we're gonna speak about the benefits of tackling these cases with an interdisciplinary mindset. And, and I'm a Crown and Bridge guy, by, I was a Crown and Bridge guy for 
a decade before I decided to challenge my uh, RDT exam. So in Canada, if you guys aren't familiar, to do your exams and to be registered, you have to do take all five disciplines in an exam during a week, and it's super stressful. But I thought I was the best of the best. I made full mouth arches, designed them in three shape. They looked great. They had like canine rise and all this fantastic, you know, crown and bridge guy things. But then I, I was forced to kind of set my first denture, and I was like, wow, I don't know anything, actually. <laughs> And it was probably one of the most eye-opening experiences for my career and really made me more well-rounded understanding dentistry, dental lab technology with a more comprehensive aspect. And really taking removable prosthodontics, fixed prosthodontics, and merging it all together has been invaluable for pivoting my career towards working with full arch implants and the complex stuff that we do. And really understanding the principles of ceramics, zirconia, all these material science things that I learned from Crown and Bridge, and pairing that with my five dentures that I've made <laughs> has, has made me so, so, so much better. And John, you're, you can talk a little bit more about the, the actual removable aspects because you actually know what you're talking about. So. <laughs> well, I, I touched on it earlier. You know, I, I, I really believe that, that a, a fixed Crown and Bridge uh, can be related in so many of the terms that we're using in dentures today. You know, we, if we look at a uh, partially inodulated arch and you can look at where the remaining teeth are, you can see very clearly where the other teeth were at one time. And when you start to train your mind to be able to see those things, it carries over to every aspect of the prosthetics that we work on. And the correlation between certain challenges that we have are, are no different. And I like to say, I can do everything that's on this list right here digitally. Some are gonna be more efficient using a analog background to it. But ultimately, if I didn't have my wisdom based on setting teeth, it would have been that much harder. I didn't start as a ceramist. We certainly didn't do a lot of crown and bridge, after so many years, I acquired a crown and bridge. And can you imagine having a, a ownership of, of a laboratory that was t essentially a, 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 a removable lab, but now he's taking on fixed work and he doesn't have any idea about how the path's going for that. There's plenty of lab owners out there that are businessmen. Well, I'm a, I'm a tech. I'm gonna sit down at the bench. I'm gonna bust my ass to figure out how, how to do this stuff. That's what I love to do, it's fun. But it took me years to understand that I'm setting this central in this position because the natural tooth was in this position and how is that gonna correlate and what benefit is that gonna be? And when I embraced digital, it allowed me to do some amazing things. And today, I think that it's that difficult to bring a new tech in that doesn't have any experience with their hands. All they're gonna do is make something that resembles a denture. So guys, I think that, that your wisdom bringing it into the trade is super, super powerful. And, and really, when you're driving some of these larger cases, I'm gonna to touch on orthodontics just a little bit here. Sometimes, you know, these patients are partially edentulous. They have spaces that have kind of collapsed in, teeth have over erupted. So sometimes when you're doing these diagnostics, when you're playing with that case in that diagnostic phase, what I will do is I will suggest to the dentist that, hey, you know what, maybe we need to do a little bit of Invisalign or a little bit of, of orthodontics and move the teeth, not necessarily to have them perfect, but much closer to that final prosthetic position. So this will extend the treatment for you know another year or so while they mull it over or if they are gonna go through that course. But it's amazing to see that data as well. Sometimes when you overlay these cases where they were initially, after they do the treatment and how close the ortho movement is to your proposed diagnostic, because it's super powerful using something like Zoom where you hop on with the, the prosthodontist, you hop on the phone with the orthodontist who's gonna be doing all this, and you as the lab technician present this case, and you go, okay, well, I want these teeth to move here, here, and here, and the, pro, and the, the ortho is gonna go, well, you know what, you can't move it that far, but I can extract this one, right? Mm -hmm. And there's that back and forth dynamic, and it's great, you, and you can revise your design on the fly or maybe you do it a little bit after and represent. But this gives you so much more power to get things where you need them to be rather than compromising the, the case to you know, maybe perhaps accommodate something that's there. So orthodontics, super powerful thing if you're working with some of these fixed full mouth cases. I, I so agree. Yeah, from somebody that used to do six over six veneer cases, you know, three or four of them a week, 
It used to be a big part of our, our, our aspect. And, and that instant gratification when they're cutting teeth to try to fill a space, close a black triangle, uh, you know, give them instant ortho. Ethically, back in the day, it's not great, guys. Man, you're cutting great enamel off a tooth for vanity. Wouldn't it be better with our technology that we have today, put them in a small aligner system that is going to move teeth to save tooth structure. Teeth are golden, guys. You know, I want to keep mine until I'm in the, in, in the coffin. But the truth is, is most of these people want instant gratification. And the hard part is presenting the treatment that is most effective, but ethically, that's your job. That's what you need to be able to do. They may say no, and that's fine, but how powerful it is to be the expert, to be able to collaborate and say, doc, if we do this, this is what I'm able to do, and this is why it's better. That's super cool, guys, and, and I, I resonate with that, and, and with aligners I, I, is one of the weakest things that I've ever ever been a part of in dentistry. I, I haven't embraced that aspect. Uh, men uh, came with that, that notion and it's something that's opened my eyes to potential that uh, is unfounded in a lot of ways in small labs. Plug for Argon if you want to and you want to get started, send it to them for, uh, <laughs> for clear aligners. But yeah, so we can speak about this a little bit because we're Let's see how we are. We don't got a lot of time. We don't got a lot of time, but let's, let's, let's glance fun, over this. But I will talk a little bit about this. There's very few things in this industry that are regulated. Running your business clean and effective requires GMPs to be managed. And why is it? Why do we need to have you know, lot numbers and reference numbers? And why do we have to know what products worked with this? And Mrs. Smith's full arch uh, case was milled in which zirconia and all this stuff. Why are the records so important? Well, one, it's good to be able to match shades and do fun stuff in the future, but the most important part is patient safety. The whole reason we keep this is for the potential of recall. And so often the small labs are not recording data properly. It just doesn't happen. You know, oh, this is Zerk Crown. I don't know what the hell it was, you know. Have the lot reference numbers on that. Most of your CAM software will have a backup for you to be able to do these things. But it's so simple. You run it through the program, you write down this information, just like every implant component and part needs to have records. People aren't doing that, guys. And it's one of the few things that you are required by law to do. So please think about this. It affects your business, but most importantly, it's for the benefit of that patient. And so we spoke a lot about the setup and everything. A little plug for John here uh, tomorrow. If you want to see how we take this, he takes it to the finish with his presentation tomorrow from uh, 11 to 12.30. We'll be, you'll be speaking about Come on, putting Bob. it all together. It's, it's, it's a really good presentation. He showed me some of it already, so it, it's a good one. And this photo I took it yesterday, it's just one of the best photos I ever took, and I just, I just inserted it because I'm really proud of it. <laughs> so. Yeah, that case went out the door yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. It was an upper and lower um, with an uh, inner bar. Yeah. So uh, a little bit, again, we've touched on communicating directly with patients already, but uh, I think we can tell a little bit of a story. Real quick. Real so quick. Yeah. how many of you guys do custom shades in your laboratory today? How many of you guys like to do custom shades in your laboratory? Not one of you. You know, if you're commanding a $2,000 a unit single central fee, well, hell, that's your business model. How will you do it? What we are doing when we're communicating to the patient is we're taking the burden from your client. Client might have done a restoration, doesn't fit. I can't get this shade, I'm gonna just send it to the lab. Okay, over the years, I will, I will do custom shades for a very few select local clients. Not because I, I think it's a valuable service, but because I'm their partner and I'm gonna go above board to try to make it work. But with that, you have to have the ability to talk to these people in a manner that is realistic. They come in, and you look at it, I, hey, I know my quality, I know what I can do. If it's above what my potential is, I'm gonna be very honest. Hey, you're gonna be able to see this in your mouth. You're gonna see every nuance. And from conversational distance, they're going to say it blends and looks beautiful. If they have unrealistic expectations, you have to be just as strong as you are with your client to steer them, prepare them for this. 
but working with them is in a different mode than how you work with your clients. You, you gotta talk to them in a non-technical term. You gotta talk to them in feeling terms. And you gotta give them realistic expectations. So again, they're through COVID, it was the best thing ever. Oh, we're not seeing patients now. So I, I didn't have to do any custom shades. It was a benefit to COVID because of that. And for the longest time, way after the scare, oh, we're still for the health and safety of our, our technicians. <laughs> wink, wink. But, but we're back to doing it now. And honestly, guys, it, it, I enjoy connecting with, with patients and my, my staff. It, it's a struggle, you know, breaks up the day sometimes, but it's important that you recognize why we do it. And if you wanna connect with these people and do this stuff, hallelujah, but charge for your service. Don't do it for free. All right. So the last thing about connect, that patient-centric approach, really, right? Oftentimes, yeah, we are running a business. We, there is a lot of commercialization in dentistry and, and often businesses put the interest of the business ahead of the patient. And that should never be the case. We are health professionals at the end of the day. We are making medical devices. And the, the, the question I always ask myself is, would I want this in my mouth? Would I want this in my mother's mouth? Would I want this in my wife's mouth, right? And you have to give that patient that same level of respect. Yes, John said it, we are in the business of making money, but we're in the business of making money by doing our best possible job that we can. And, and really the whole point of all this pontification is, is we, we want to see this industry grow in, in, in the right and the best possible way. So that this is, this is our, our preaching on a, on a soapbox and hopefully it connects with some My of you guys. My final word on the subject is, guys, you can pick and choose what you want to do in your life. I think that if you, uh, want to be a good person, you're going to do good things. And sometimes it's harder to do good things, but it's never wrong to do the best thing. So guys, think about this. Hopefully it resonates. There's things that come into my laboratory. I am happy to say no. I'm happy to say it. I have the power to say it because I know it's the best for that situation. All right. So some last final thoughts on ethics in dental technology. Making sure that you're choosing the best, highest quality materials. You know, when you're working with, you know, single molars in the posterior, a zirconia is zirconia is zirconia, right? But when you're working with these large complex cases where you want that zirconia to be as robust as possible, fun plug for argon, right? There you go. You're gonna wanna partner with a company that uses isostatically pressed zirconia because it ensures that it's very uniformly pressed, right? If it's just axially pressed zirconia when you're working with full arches, maybe it could fail, right? You wanna make sure that you're part of the equation, you're owning that part of the equation and that you're standing behind the materials that you're working with. Of course, following those IFUs, right? They publish IFUs, they have them online. You wanna make sure that you're following those IFUs, but also when to deviate from those IFUs. So this is another fun story from inside the lab. One of our ceramists said to me, hey, you know what? The, the zirconia is kind of centering, it looks a little bit under-centered but it's centering, Argon Zirconia centers at 1510 and all our furnaces are centered at 1510. But I check everything and it does look a little bit under centered. What's going on? Well, that's a result of the actual furnace design, right? Furnaces over time, you know, they're gonna have hot spots, they're gonna have cold spots and depending on where you place it in there, where the thermocouple is, where it detects the temperature, may register 1510, but the bottom of that furnace may be five, 10 degrees lower. So I actually, I center our zirconia at 1515 rather than the 1510 on one of the furnaces, the other one is 1510. So you really have to go through and communicate within the lab as well to make sure you're, getting, you're keeping your quality as high as possible. Calibration, guys. Calibration, calibration, calibration. Use those, use those ferro rings, they make a big difference yep. and it will, it will aid you in realizing what's really going on. And you know you can have you know load up your oven with a, a bunch of units, and the and the, the temperature range is going to be manipulated by the mass that's in there as well. Especially these big zerk arches. Can we fit more arches in the centering of it? Absolutely, but we are, aren't able to calibrate how the difference is with multiples in there, and you will have a different result. So again, systems. The systems come into place for a reason, and that's why we use it today. So let's get to the game. I think we're almost yeah, there, Yeah, I think right? we're good. Yeah, regulatory compliance, you know, 
Make sure you follow the laws. <laughs> Using validated processes, making sure that everything is validated when, especially with the advent of 3D printing. We, we almost glammed over these yeah, yeah. things right here. Yeah. But those are really those are very important. important. Very important. The, the, the truth of the matter is, is guys, we, we follow the rules. There's things in your lab that you can break rules with, but that's not one of the ones that you should. Uh, the validated processes, I, I, I'll just touch on it real quick. You know, I consider a validated process one that I have wisdom over a large sample See, size of things we're that I do. <laughs> Not just because the manufacturer has spent the money to put together a package to be able to say that this okay. mill, this software, and this final restoration is going to fit in that process. I don't, I don't connect with that aspect of it. That's just money. The truth is, is doing the right thing is never wrong. When you know you're half-assing it, you're not using any validated process at that point, guys. So again, utilize the, the technology for what it is, but utilize your heart to drive you in the right direction and do the right things. And you, you, well, one last thing about that is you wanna make sure that um, when you're printing medical devices, so if you're printing models on a printer, it doesn't really matter, right? But if you're printing night guards, if you're printing dentures, if you're printing anything that's going into somebody's body, right? These are resins, They're, they react with the environment, they react with oxygen, right? So if you work with composites or anything like that and you've cured something, you know that you get that oxygen inhibited layer, that smear layer. So when you have to make sure that you're using a validated curing unit, a validated printer, and making sure that it's inert so that you eliminate the possibility of any of those cytotoxicity or adverse effects of contact with uncured resins. So anyways, with that, um, I mean, so the, the mystery behind the, the mustache, of course, is John really, he, he grew it out because he got the mustache, I'm the Canadian, so the two of us together make Alex Trebek, essentially. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it's showtime. Okay, so let's get our three volunteers up here. We're gonna get you guys all mic'd up and, and ready to go. I think everybody knows how to play Geo Parody, just so we're not, yeah, don't run into no any copyright. any copyright no issues. Copyrights. Uh, so let me get these buzzers all set up here. So guys, this is gonna be a fun. This is gonna be game. fun. So this is how it's gonna work. You know, I, I think we got a little truth, buzzers. The truth is, is there most of the 100, 200, and 300 dollar answers were discussed today. So we've given you some hints. If you were listening, uh, you might have just the general knowledge already on these things. No, you, you guys can stay standing. The 400 and 500 dollar answers are tougher. And those are the ones that most likely will be a lot of non-answers. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna make you earn it. But if, you, if nobody answers it, we'll go to the audience and see if Yeah, we're gonna somebody. do that. So if the three contestants don't get it, we're going to go to the audience. And get it. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so we're gonna do that. And then these little paddles are for Final Jeopardy. We'll get you guys each a marker as well. Look at that. And I'm gonna keep score. So keep track. Let's switch over to black. And that's you get the pick. Purple or red. There you go. All right. All right. That's good. I think we are ready. So let's play Jeopardy or Geo Parody yeah. so we don't have any copyright issues. So welcome to Dental Tech Geo Parody. I was inspired by my friend Mark Dixon who did a fun game show during, uh, during COVID there. So this is our, our take on it to do it live. So here are the categories. It's all zirconia. Denturely departed. The artist formerly known as Prince. 3D printing. Academics. You can just say academics. Implant this. And then of course, two dudes talking teeth. Talking teeth. <laughs> all right, so let's put the answers up on the board. You're gonna control that and he's gonna use his best Trebek voice to do all this. All right, and Savon, you are going no, to be no, starting no, up the game. No, yeah, Savon, you're gonna start and then the next like winner is gonna like, yeah. All right, I'll take, it's all zirconia for 400. Alex. Ooh, 400. We're going to the big one. Ooh, going big. I don't know why 500s. Presenting, representing the Y in YTZP this material is added to zirconia in order to stabilize it. All right, Jonas. Yttrium. Let's see. Yes, sir. All right, and it. that's 500 for you. Okay. <laughs> About 400, okay. I'm gonna keep track, I'm gonna keep score. All right. Um, 
let's do. Uh, it's also going for five hundred. All's are going oh, for going 500. Big time. <laughs> this method of producing zirconia ensures uniform compression. Isostatically pressed. Oh, there yes, we sir. go. So Jonas with 400, Savon with 500. Okay, Esther's got to get on the board. Okay. <laughs> All right, Savon. All right, Savon. I'll take. I'll take implant this for 400. Implant this for 400. Discovered in the 1860s in New, in New Bedford, Massachusetts. This name is after its crater. This is the type of taper it creates a hermetic seal to prevent bacterial infiltration of the implant. Morse. Oh, oh, oh. You are correct. Oh. 900. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um. Oh man. Implant this for 300. Okay. This unit of measurement. <laughs> oh, Esther. In Newton's force? Yeah, that's good enough. Ooh. We'll give it to you. That was a 300. All right. Well, let me give you a cheer. <laughs> okay, Esther. Damn sure it's for 400. <laughs> oh, surprise, oh. surprise, surprise. <laughs> okay. These hold found in the bottom of porcelain denture teeth. Diet tour? Oh, yes, yes sir. that's right. Should we wait for you to read him? <laughs> no, I think okay. it's faster. Everybody wants to get to lunch <laughs> anyway. So that's the game plays live like okay. that. Just bang this. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's do dentures for where's the next one? Oh, five hundred. Dentures for five. Man, you guys are going for the, the big win. This set of small depressions, posterior aspect. <laughs> and I don't have to read anymore because she knows it is the posterior pelvic seal. No, do the do the thing. Do the thing. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. See. Okay, John. For the read, benefit of our other contestants. Read the read the whole thing now, and let's see. This set of small depressions in the posterior aspect of the hard palate are anatomical landmarks used in aiding to determine the placement of the post. Interior palatal seal. He yeah, that's you. Savon. Oh, hemular notches? No. <laughs> I think she knows. <laughs> she I think knows she it knows. now. Read the whole question. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Read the IFU, guys. Read the IFU before you proceed. All right, okay. we're just going to go to the answer, and the answer is anybody in the audience? Anybody in the audience? Yes, Valentine sir. Valentine phobia. Okay, no points for you guys. Okay. Okay, let's go home. Let's see. All right, Esther, you get to you get to choose again. Dentures for three hundred. Dentures for three hundred. I'll read it this time. <laughs> this is the average measurement from maxillary labial frenum to mandibular labial frenum, typically used in the fabrication of wax rims and record bases. Forty millimeters. Oh. Upper, sorry, Twenty-two upper. Absolutely. Oh, look correct. at that. Woo. Okay, Esther, how much was that? Three hundred. Three hundred. Okay. Let's do talking teeth for 300. Let's switch it up. For 300. Talking teeth, 300. This term coming from Latin and meaning to shed is the technical term for primary or baby teeth. Technical term. Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Audience. Deciduous? Yes, sir. Ooh. That's what we got. Deciduous <laughs> teeth. There we go. All right. <laughs> uh, talking teeth. 400 it is. Hyperdontia is an anomaly that occurs when someone has too many teeth. Those extra teeth are called this. Extra numerary? I'll take it. We're gonna... Uh, we'll, we'll take it. Super numerary? Uh, Very good. Okay, that was 300. Okay. Let's do... Academics for 500. Academics Woo! for 500, okay. This term refers to the process of using specialized CAD software to extract specific anatomical structures, such as teeth or jaw bones from a cone being computed. Tom off. Tomography slice. Damn it. Slices. Uh, 
There you go. Let's hear it. A surgical guide? No. Audience? Anybody? Segmentation. Segmentation. There you CBCT go. segmentation. For the audience. Yeah, yeah. Woohoo! For the audience. <laughs> All right. Let's do academics for 400. Academics for 400. In three shape, renaming an anatomy for elements folder to. Anatomy for you. Oh, yes. yes, sir. We have oh, Jonas, Jonas is in the lead. Let's, he's, let's he's, talk about the... No, I know, I know. I just, I just, I just, <laughs> so, so Jonas right now has 1,800, Savon with 500, and Esther at 600. So It's anybody's game. It's anybody's game. We still... All right. Let's do academics for 300. Oops. 300. This is the de facto standard 3D file format. It's almost all scanners Savon. and CAD software. STL. Yes, sir. That's right. Well, Wrapping up to the finish line, we're coming in very close race. Somewhat close. Jonas is kind of <laughs> kicking their asses. <laughs> Let's go with uh, implant this for two. Implant this for two. In order to angle correct, ensure draw and passivity. Yes, sir. Multi-unit abundance. That's right. Yes, sir. All right. Very good. Okay, Esther. Uh, dentures for 200. This method of creating a pattern of small dots on the surface of a denture base is intended to break up the light and mimic nature. What is the point? Yes. Oh, well, Esther's she catching. Use the what, is <laughs> what is sibling? That's right. Yeah, we kind of uh, damn it. We, we, we yeah, we we, we should be that. super damn. super. <laughs> All right, guys, guys, let's go. All right, Esther. Uh, the artist formerly known as Prince. Four. Four hundred. Four hundred. Four hundred. I don't think the five hundred dollar question was. I think it was grayed out, but yeah. okay. <laughs> 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 Anyways, okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. We gotta take that? Uh, yeah, I guess. Okay, we'll take it. IPA, not beer. So, 20. Which we will probably be drinking alcohol later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, let's go. All right. Uh, implant this for 500. Implant this, 500. The 500 answer is, these long implants anchor into this bone. Zygomatic. We'll take it. We'll take it. Zygoma. 2600, Jonas, you are. Really way ahead. <laughs> Commanding lead, but Commanding lead. Is <laughs> yes, yes. Somebody needs to take the 500. All answer. right. All right. Uh, talking to you for five minutes. Talking. Woo. The term named after the person who discovered it represents the measurement from the gum line of the maxillary central incisor to the gum line of the mandibular. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who, who pressed it? And it's roughly 19 minute, mil millimeters plus or minus one. Starts with an S. Break it. Shimbashi. <laughs> yeah! Oh, oh, oh. Woo! Ah, okay, Savon. Very good. Savon with 1,300. Let's go. Uh, let's do it's all zirconia for three. Argent ST and HT zirconia. St Standard and long program centered at this final temperature. 1510. <laughs> yeah, somebody was listening. <laughs> Woo. Let's go. Um, yeah, we were supposed to be doing this right I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> He's stalling. It, it's all zirconia out of time, for 200. Alex. <laughs> it's all zirconia for 200. This unit of measurement or abbreviation is commonly used to describe zirconia strength. MPA or megapas megapascals? Almost yeah, identical. Almost identical. Uh, let's go with, uh, let's finish off zirconia for 100. Representing zirconia dioxide, this is the chemical formula, formula for zirconia. The anatomical name. Chemical name. Nobody? Anybody? No. The letters. would <laughs> be ZRO2. We'll give it to we'll you. Give it to you. <laughs> we'll give it to you just for the. We should penalize him we on should. that one. Just because he said, <laughs> just because that was the easiest answer. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's go. All right, coming in. 
Let's do uh, academics at 200. Three letter acronym for CAD. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jonas. Uh, <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, academics for 100. The $100 answer is, this software and scanner company was founded in Denmark in the year of 2000. <laughs> Three shapes. <laughs> he's very fast on the he's, <laughs> he's got lightning reflexes. He is very fast on the buzzer. <laughs> uh, let's do implant this for 100. This device or marker is used to relay implant position and data captured via digital impression scan. Savon. What is the scan body? Yes, Savon. sir. That's the right answer. All right. <laughs> uh, let's go uh, uh, finish off dentures with 100. This US president is mistakenly credited to have wooden teeth. Who's Washington? That's there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Esther. Uh, talking teeth for 200. For 200, this additional cusp is typically found. Cusp of the <laughs> Yes, we got another. Talking teeth for 100. $100 answer. This type of rest is usually placed on the lingual surface of a maxillary canine. Yes. What is it? Yep. Is it rest? Yes, it is. We're narrowly approaching the final answers. Uh, Three hundred. Sticky layer left on a print of resin that has not been cured in an inert environment is commonly called this. Savon. The oxygen barrier. Close. Oxygen layer. <laughs> We're gonna take residue. it. I think we're gonna be liberal here. Yes. Uh, we'll take it. We'll take it just because they were. All right. Savon, catch All right, two hundred. To ensure regulatory compliance and patient safety, it's important to use a printer, resin profile, and a post cure unit that is this. Validated. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. And the final answer. In contrast to reductive technologies like milling and printing is a form of this type of manufacturing. Additive. Yes, it is. And the Woo. numbers are. <laughs> All right. Well, no, we got one more. We got final Jeopardy, final guys. Jeopardy. Final Jeopardy. Final Jeopardy. Okay. So uh, if you guys are familiar with Jeopardy, we have to write our answer on there. So let's go click on final Jeopardy here. Click it. Yep. And let me, is the audio there? Okay. We're good. So there's going to be a, let's show them the category. Click again. Click again. And the category is who and what. So we're looking for two, at least two words for the answer. We're looking for a person and what it is. Okay. So first you have to think about how much you want to wager. So you got to tell exactly. Yeah. So, so Jonas with 3,900 in the lead, Savon next at 1,900 and then Esther 1,200. All right. So put down your wagers, how much you want to wager. Esther, you're cheating. You can see what he's writing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're ready to okay, go. Okay, so the, here's the question. Click. Yep. It's not going. Literally. Okay. Oh. Went too far. Okay. In 1952, this Swedish based scientist discovered the revolutionary process that is the basis of modern implantology. So who and what? Who so and what? Who and, and what? And then just click start timer. Okay, in Indian. third place, it's going to be starting with... Esther. Who is Brian Mark? Unfortunately, that's only half correct. Okay, let's see. Uh, Jonas? Well, actually, let's do Savon next. Yeah. 
said Brandenmark is a Brandenmark implant? Unfortunately, that's half correct. <laughs> Let's read the, the question again. We're going to cheat here. What was the name of that revolutionary process? Austrian integration, Brandenburg? Cheater. Oh, 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 you were winning anyway. He was you winning anyway. The answer, Yay! of course, is <laughs> Professor hey, Brandenburg with Austrian integration. So, Jonas. Austrian integration. And how much did you wait? Well, it didn't matter it anyways. Matter. <laughs> you are the winner. <laughs> so, we have the $100 gift card to you, Jonas. But also for everybody else being such a good sport, uh, Argon has been so, so wonderful and they're providing everyone with uh, some Argon credits as well for everyone being participants. So thank, thank you, you so much, playing. Stephanie and the whole team. It was, it was wonderful. So. Awesome, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you for sticking with us. It was fun. Yeah.